Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. Uh, been following the conference uh, for the last two days, and it's been exceptionally uh, well presented and, and smooth. So I'm I'm very happy to uh, to be here to present Comstock Mining. I think that it's actually a quite uh, timely uh, uh, presentation for us because we've achieved a sig significant number of milestones that really position us. Uh, to move forward with uh, with existing business opportunities and new business opportunities. The story is not as well understood, so I very much appreciate uh, Noble hosting us to allow us to present our story, represent our story, and um, answer any questions that may come out of it. Overall, the Comstock load is one of the most famous, if not uh, the most famous uh, silver discovery in the state of Nevada and in the United States for that matter. The original uh, silver uh, discovery occurred in 1859 when um, when the old timers stumbled upon some, some purple mud. And it's uh, quite funny because the whole northern part of the district is um, is mountainous. There's a lot of outcroppings. Some people will joke that the old timers literally tripped over and stepped in to this purple mud, which when assayed turned out to be almost pure silver sulfates. So the, the history of the Comstock load is that it produced almost 200 million ounces of silver, a staggering number, and over 8 million ounces of gold in what is essentially about a two and a half mile strike. In the graphic that you see uh, to the left of the screen, anything in purple, you know, be it light purple or dark purple, represents our property position. Essentially, if you went from the top of the first blue circle down to the bottom of the last blue circle, uh, that represent, represents about a six mile contiguous mineralized strike. There were about 33 uh, bonanzas discovered on the Comstock with the big bonanza alone representing almost 72 million ounces of silver and the Woodville bonanza being the smallest, most southerly bonanza on the load. And what we did, our claim to fame, if you will, was we consolidated uh, almost 10,000 acres of land. That represents about 2,600 acres of, of private historic uh, mining claims, patented mining claims, if you will, and about 6,400 uh, acres of unpatented uh, mining claims. Uh, when you put them all together, the dark purple is the patented claims. The uh, light purple is the unpatented claims. Um, you know, from the top to the bottom, you see a concentration of what we call the Gold Hill claims. Those are just south of Virginia City, Nevada. To the right of them, there's a, uh, a smaller batch called the Occidental Load, previously known as the Brunswick Load. To the very, very center, there's a concentration. We call that the Lucerne area. And then just south of that is, is what we call the Dayton Spring Valley area. So we've consolidated the entirety of this district and, and we are developing resources, uh, both uh, with partners in the Lucerne area where Tono Gold has partnered uh, to develop uh, the Lucerne mine into the next phase of production and to explore and develop um, north, you know, of the Lucerne mine. To the south, we have the Dayton and Spring Valley claims, which we ourselves are developing. In both cases, there are gold and silver resources, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the presentation. And then we also have a fully permitted platform. So the consolidation of the land was step one. The entitlement of it, you know, and that means literally changing master plans, implementing mining ordinances, making sure all the zoning was correct. And then it also means permitting. So we have a fully permitted platform for mining, for uh, underground mining, for open pit mining, for exploration and for development. Those permits are extended uh, to be 20 years. So the entire district uh, was entitled. And, and ready to go. We have developed two resource estimates, as I mentioned, and permitted a fully operational platform for production. We ran that platform for four years between 2012 and 2016, and we're gearing up for the next phase of development and production. The other exciting thing that I'm going to talk about is that we also launched last year 
a new business based on processing technology that allows us to take mercury from contaminated soils and not only uh, clean the soils, but also remove the trapped gold in the mercury. And so it's a different form of mining. It's a clean form of mining. And we're very excited about um, talking to you about the launch um, of that new business, which is in full swing right now. So um, comp coupling you know, that very, very strong asset base, we also realigned the company to complement that. We've established different subsidiaries, one for Northern Exploration. That's where those targets to the north that are being um, uh, prepared for drilling and development are housed. Uh, uh, exploration and development subsidiary for the targets to the south. Processing subsidiary for just as it's described, all of the physical assets, the property, the plant, the equipment, and that includes crushing facility, full zinc precipitate Merrill Crow facility, leach pads, haul roads, you know, the entire operational infrastructure. We've set up a new subsidiary because as time has progressed, we've retained a tremendous amount of royalties, um, you know, on the properties. And then we've um, launched the mercury business. So you see now we're, we focused ourselves to be a pure precious metal uh, you know, a uh, focused company, it, it's fair to say that everything we do should result in revenues from gold and or silver, you know, on the back end and um, and really, you know, really put that into focus as the uh, the singular, the singular uh, drive of our company for creating shareholder value. We have a very clean shareholder base. We have a very clean balance sheet, um, you know, about 32 million uh, common shares outstanding. We have no warrants, we have no convertibles, uh, we have no other uh, complexities. We have a very, very small amount of, um, of debt that I'll talk about in a minute that's about to, uh, to be paid off. When we look at the value proposition in terms of what we're trying to create, and I'll expound on this in, in, the, in the presentation, we have two resource estimates, one in the Dayton and one in the Lucerne. Um, in the Lucerne, uh, the average grade of, of our gold is about one gram per ton. Uh, the beautiful thing about the Comstock is there's been on average about 15 to 20 ounces of silver uh, for every ounce of gold. So the ratio between uh, gold and silver, uh, silver to gold, is about 15, on average, 15 to 20 to one. So we like the grade uh, very well. That's a very good open pick grade. Uh, certainly at higher gold prices today, it's even better. And then the day in resource, uh, which av actually has about a 50% higher grade uh, on average than the Lucerne, it's also nearer to the surface. And in both cases with, uh, with tremendous uh, metallurgical yields, uh, you know, gold percentage yields coming out of our, our plans there. When we look at the um, at the Lucerne mine, that's the one that we're partnered with Tono Gold. Tono Gold is acquiring the Lucerne. Uh, that deal will most likely get consummated uh, within the next month. We put a value of $26 million on the sale you know, of that asset. Uh, we received um, about $6.5 million of that in cash so far. Uh, but we also put an upside $60 million value on the Lucerne because we've retained royalties because we've retained um, the lease to process all of the uh, materials on Tonal Gold's behalf. And we also get subsidized for certain expenses for maintaining that platform. So we see the, um, the foundational value of 25, 26 million, but with an upside uh, revenue stream for us. Um, and, and most of these numbers originally um, contemplated a much, much lower gold price. In the Dayton, uh, Dayton resource, we have about half a million gold equivalent ounces in the Maiden resource. We're redoing that resource right now. We're going to publish an updated technical report. But we recently ran the, um, the, the economics for a very small uh, economic shell out of the Dayton. And at uh, $1,600 gold, we were looking at a, uh, about an $85 million dollar uh, valuation and at um, two thousand dollar gold, you know, it's well over a hundred million dollars. Uh, but really, our objective there is is not just to show value based on higher gold prices, but to actually explore drill and and ultimately we're looking to triple uh, the size of that uh, mine plan and move it into production. 
We have um, Mercury, two Mercury projects that we put uh, only a cost basis value on, two and three million respectively. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more, but our view is that each one of these projects would ultimately have a, million, uh, a minimum of a hundred million uh, dollar valuation. They should be thought of as uh, gold mining operations um, and they're coincidentally uh, mercury remediation uh, operations. So we're literally cleaning mercury uh, from the soils while we're extracting the gold uh, from those uh, same elements and creating a cash flow. We love the mercury remediation business. You'll you'll get that impression from me very strongly today because it's a very low capital deployment scheme for two to three million dollars. We're deploying a full uh, system, a full operation, and um, and the working capital to get it up and running in cash positive. Uh, the cash starts flowing from these things within, you know, 30 to 45 days. It's it's extremely exciting in terms of, you know, uh, low capital down, fast cash back out. And so, um, and we've also, uh, as I mentioned, retained uh, a, ro a royalty portfolio that is continuing to grow. We haven't marketed it, uh, you know, very strongly as of yet, but we will be doing that as we move forward because, you um, not only because we already have all the royalties in place, which we do, but um, all of the projects associated with those royalties are scheduled to publish updated resource reports. And so we can start to correlate value. Right now we've put very low values on it. But even if you add up you know, the, the low end of the values that we already have on the ground, uh, we come up with over $130 million, $135 million you know, a value. And so our number one objective is to make very clear uh, to the investment community that we believe we have something worth 135 million on the ground today uh, to explain it, to communicate it, to advance it. But the ultimate goal over the next two to three years is to grow those businesses, grow those resources, grow those cash flows to reflect something much closer to $500 million. So we don't think any of that is outside of our purview. We think it's right within our, uh, our, our, our target zone. And that's what we're working very hard to uh, communicate and to implement, frankly. We, we actually have a bunch of, 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 of assets that are not mining related. They were acquired coincidentally or transactionally as we were building the base remarkably. Um, you know, those assets themselves are worth over $20 million. Uh, we're looking to monetize those assets. We happen to be in a county in Nevada where there is just a tremendous amount of industrial development companies like um, Google and Switch and Walmart and many, many companies of this ilk are pouring billions of dollars into Story County. It's quite remarkable in, in so far as industrial development goes. It kicked off, I guess, in 2014 when Tesla decided that that's where they were going to build their first U.S. gigafactory. And um, I guess it's the Tesla effect. Uh, you know, a lot of companies um, realized that this was a unique place to do business, sitting, you know, something like 10 to 15 miles from the California border uh, with, a, with an incredibly pro-business um, profile, unlike California. Um, in an incredibly huge market, uh, which is California. Uh, so we're seeing uh, real estate values go up. We've contracted to sell a couple of our industrial properties that have, uh, they're not contiguous with the mine, they're not connected to the mine uh, for over $10 million. Uh, we also have some equity uh, investments in other companies that are worth over $10 million. So as we monetize those investments, we pay off the small amount of remaining debt, um, you know, it allows us to fund our go forward operations, especially the, the Dayton development and the mercury remediation. Uh, and we feel like we have a very good tight uh, share base to uh, to take value forward, you know, in that regard. The uh, the balance sheet, you know, I just point I, it's a little bit of a busy slide, but I like to show, you know, just two years ago, uh, just um, just last year, we had a lot of obligations. Um, and not as many assets. And um, we're literally on the brink. The second to the last column is next month. And the last column is the end of this year where we should be sitting in, in with $20 million of liquid assets. That is cash and marketable securities um, that we can monetize uh, with essentially no net obligations. So that is the result of 
frankly, three and a half years of extremely hard work. Um, we had to reposition the company. We had to pay down a significant amount of debt and other obligations. The only good news I can share there is it's 95% behind us, and we're very excited. Similar to one of the earlier presenters, I think Jaguar, you know, we, we had a, a, a very a heavy debt obligation um, with no revenues when we when we started this about three and a half years ago. And I mean, when we started the restructuring and uh, now we fully reposition the balance sheet uh, to have no debt, um, to have um, strong cash position. And ultimately, um, the cash flow that comes from the mercury remediation business is what we're most excited about relative to that balance sheet. So just to give some color on each one of those opportunities, this is a picture in orange of the Lucerne uh, mine area. That is where Tono Gold Resources has acquired the mine. They are positioning a brand new uh, technical report and resource estimate. Um, you know, we're looking towards um, a very nice production profile and they're looking to expand that production profile you know, as they move forward. The green area is Comstock Processing. That is our wholly owned subsidiary that owns all of our manufacturing equipment. That is our crusher, our Merrill Crow, our zinc precipitate uh, processing uh, facility. Uh, so we own and control all of that. We're Tono as a partner uh, will own fully 100% of the Lucerne mine and move it back uh, towards production. The, the, uh, the date and resource is um, sort of one step behind that. The Dayton resource, uh, we did a tremendous amount of geophysical work. The Dayton, unlike the Lucerne in the north, is in a valley area. In the north, as I mentioned, there's a lot of outcroppings. It's somewhat mountainous. The terrain's a little bit more rugged. In in the valley, as it's as it sounds, it's, it's flatter. But there's about 35 to 40 feet of alluvium uh, covering the the hard you know the base rock and so um, there hadn't been much mining historically you know in the southern part of the district so we did a tremendous amount of geophysics we did a tremendous amount of geophysical and structural interpretation and then when we started drilling lo and behold you know just below that uh, surface pediment you know we started to hit higher grades and economic grades of ore quite a bit of it as you can see on this slide over 100 feet of economic ore, including 30 feet of almost a quarter of an ounce per ton. So we're very excited about the Dayton Spring Valley configuration. We did um, we did more drilling against those geophysics, and we outlined an initial economic shell. So if you look at that little blue, kind of looks like a polywog, you know, at the top of the screen, that's the economic shell that we carved out. That shell had an average grade of, of about one and three quarters grams. Uh, per ton. When we initially did the shell, it was uh, an 800 pound, an 800 dollar an ounce equivalent cutoff, with about 40 million dollars of um, of cash flow that resulted from a very very small initial uh, economic mine, if you will. Uh, we then did a bit more drilling and we updated the economics. Just recently, I put a 1600 dollar gold price on it, which showed about 75 million dollars of cash flow. Um, we had SRK come in and take a look at that economic shell, which you know our version of it uh, was in um, was was at the top. So SRK came in, they they replicated and validated that version, which we were very happy about. And then they did some expansion profiles, you know, based on what the geology and the geological extensions looked like. So though that that blue version of this mine is what we're really looking to create. That would be a uh, more than doubling, almost tripling of the economic resource. None of these numbers that you see on this slide reflect that. That's what we want to create in terms of uh, increasing, surging, if you will, uh, the value that we believe we already have. But just recently, I put $2,000 gold you know, on that same small shell. Uh, and I want to emphasize, we didn't change the cutoff. We didn't re-engineer the shell. We just said, you know, given that $800 cutoff profile, what would it look like at $2,000 gold? And it goes well over a hundred million. So, you know, what are we talking about here? We're talking about 80 to 100,000 ounce shell that's worth a hundred million dollars because it's got such incredible grades so near to the surface. Uh, but our goal ultimately is to, to try to triple, you know, that resource. And then you have quarter of a billion 
uh, 300 million economic value or more, uh, which we're very excited about. I mentioned the realignment. It positioned us not only to be focused, you know, with Tono Gold on the Lucerne, focused on our southern exploration projects like the Dayton Spring Valley that I just walked you through. It allows us to, to delineate our royalties, which we have not yet done publicly, but we have an incredible list of royalties that um, we believe have great future value. And then with the Mercury business, it's positioned us now uh, you know, to uh, to launch our first system here in the United States. We call it Comstock uh, Mercury Remediation. The system has landed uh, last week. It was about, so far, about a $2 million investment. It, it caps out at $3 million, uh, but the system is being assembled and it'll start test operating this month. I'll show you some pictures here in just a minute. And then surprisingly, we were approached by the Philippine government um, this is because mercury remediation has become an international priority. The United Nations has uh, mandated through the Minamata Convention, of which 140 nations, including the Philippines and including the United States, signed up for, almost everybody signed up for, with the goal of eliminating, eradicating uh, mercury from industrial mining around the world. Uh, some people are aware that mercury was used in the late 1800s and early 1900s, certainly in the U.S., certainly on the Comstock, uh, certainly with old historic abandoned um, uh, mines. But uh, many people weren't aware that uh, small-scale and artisanal miners all around the world still use mercury, and they use mercury in much, much higher-grade environments as they're small-scale miners. Um, it takes high grade for them uh, to be effective, and mercury is a very easy way albeit a very toxic way for them to, um, you know, extract those minerals. So the, Mer the Philippines um, create an opportunity for us. Next week, we're shipping our first international unit uh, to the Philippines, and we will set up a, a multi-system unit um, all along a 27-kilometer river called the Nabok River, which is one of the uh, most gold-rich and uh, highest mercury-contaminated places in the world. And uh, we'll look to have two systems in place, one in the United States and one in uh, the Philippines, to, to, to show everyone uh, the potential of our technology. And, um, <clears throat> you know, our, our credibility here is high because the Comstock used mercury in the late 1800s, as I mentioned, um, the residual mercury ultimately found its way down into the Carson River in Carson City, Nevada, and the Carson River was dubbed uh, a Superfund site, uh, you know, by the U.S. EPA. Uh, so we have um, already received uh, reclamation awards of excellence by the state of Nevada for cleaning up mercury uh, and remediating mercury, so we have a, a competency in doing that. We also won an award uh, for literally ripping out an entire highway, sealing a historic 1,000-foot vertical shaft, and repairing the highway. And the federal government gave us also a reclamation award, uh, not only for sealing that shaft, but for removing that mercury. And so um, we, we, we come with a lot of operational competency. We come with a tremendous amount of um, environmental competency, huge regulatory support at the federal U.S. EPA and local Nevada EPA level, uh, proving ourselves as, as one of the foremost. So then we were approached uh, by um, a group of, of, of experts in processing equipment, and they've created this system. The pictures that you're seeing in front of you now are the ones to the left where the whole system um, assembled in the plant in California. The one to the right is its state of assembly on the Comstock as we speak. Uh, within a week, it'll be um, fully assembled and we'll start uh, test operations. And this system is going to be designed to remove mercury from the soils such that the residual mercury is so small that it will be approved by the EPA for any application. Just as importantly, we can extract the mercury uh, from, I'm sorry, the gold from the mercury. The system is equipped with, um, with, with an entire mobility, meaning it can, it's mobile and it can operate um, 
both in cleaning soils, uh, extracting mercury, extracting gold, and purifying water with a DAF unit um, wherever it is positioned. So um, that, that's the unit that's on the Comstock. The unit that you're seeing now is the one that's being prepared for shipment to the Philippines. It, it's, um, you see these red cylinders, those are mercury centrifuges. And so this system is more equipped to purify at higher rates of speed sand and gravel by taking the mercury and the gold you know, out of that sand and gravel. In this case, we'll not only be extracting mercury and gold, but we'll also be cleaning and selling sand and gravel for use in construction. So it's quite remarkable. We believe that the Philippines uh, will represent a, a world leading example of a massive environmental cleanup. We also believe the Comstock is on a similar scale of importance, you know, in terms of cleanup. And so it'll position us as the global leader. Uh, we're moving fast on all of, of these activities. Um, we have um, we have the non-mining properties for sale. That'll be one of the next big things that people hear about. When that happens, the $4 million of debt that we have will go to zero. Our cash balance will go to over six, you know, and then we'll um, we'll continue to move not only the Dayton um, resource estimate for publication, but also you'll see dr drilling on the Dayton, you'll see drilling on the Lucerne, you'll see drilling on some of the northern targets, and you'll see mercury systems uh, start to be uh, generating cash on the um, on the back end of this year. So um, with that, um, I will. Um, look to conclude my prepared comments and maybe turn back to Brandon for um, some Q&A. Thank you. As well. Um, I know, Corrado, you and I have a few seconds away when I, my camera comes on, so you'll see me in just a second. <laughs> uh, I, I just kept talking throughout it, so it keeps flowing really nicely. Great presentation. Uh, lots of great stuff in there. And, and there's some really detailed questions uh to get to as well so i think we just sure. jump right into there because uh, quite a few came in i think there was a good eight to ten had come in uh, so we'll start, uh right from the very top here uh, and there's upvotes as well by the way uh there's a function where if an investor sees this they can click on it to upvote to the top uh aaron you have four of those most throughout the whole conference we're going to go with your question first <laughs> Great. Uh, with today's announcement of the new unsecured financing obtained to pay off the debenture are you still on schedule to close the Silver Springs deal in Q3, or do you expect further delays in that closing? Yes, no, great question. So the Silver Springs assets are the um, the two industrial properties that I mentioned. Uh, they are contracted for sale for $10.1 million. Uh, they're sitting right at the um, intersection of the Tajarino Industrial uh, Highway and uh, Highway 50, which created a huge value surge in those properties when, uh, when Tesla came in and and the state started building all that infrastructure. Uh, we have $400,000 in escrow, uh, and we're looking to close that by the end of September. It was slowed a bit by the COVID crisis, um, I think, because the um, the counterparty is, is raising capital. Um, they've raised capital successfully. They continue to do that. And so we're looking forward to a third quarter close for sure. I absolutely appreciate the answer there. Uh, this next question uh, is from Jason. Um, can you please comment on the potential market for the mercury uh, remediation? Completely botched sure. that word. Business. Sure. <laughs> it's been a long day. No, no that's a great question. I, I'd like to give some insight on that. So, so you know, mer mercury is has been pervasive in the mining industry. And as I mentioned in my presentation, historically in the first world and currently in the third world, we just did a little bit of research. Um, there are thousands of abandoned mines in Nevada alone thousands of abandoned mine in Nevada loans, a significant majority of which have mercury contamination. So we're kind of blown away by how how much is literally just just in Nevada. But as we as we span the world, um, it's overwhelming the amount of um, of countries that are still using mercury and how difficult it is. The Philippines was one of the first to come down very hard, but they're not the only one. You've seen examples in Peru and in other locations where the governments are saying, stop the mercury. And um, um, so so I think our biggest challenge, it's a global market. I, I, I can't quantify it. It's in the billions without any question. And I think our biggest challenge will be selecting um, which sites, right, that we would accept, you know, for, for our system. I will say this, 
we were approached by, um, we've always been working with the local EPA. Um, you know, we have great relationship with District 9 out of San Francisco, District 8 out of Denver. They're very excited about what we've been doing. Uh, but we were also approached by the federal government uh, policymakers who took, um, they have some um, mandate to implement the Minamata Convention globally. And then when we spoke to them, they said, well, whoa, you know, would you mind speaking with the State Department? And we spoke with the State Department two weeks ago, and they're saying that they, they see some technologies out there to clean up, but they haven't really found one that can not only clean the existing uh, contamination, but then operate going forward without chemicals. So they say they see us as the almost the 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 um, the complete solution for mercury. In other words, not only can you clean up a bad place, you can actually process clean going forward, so you don't recontaminate it. So I, I you know, the market. I'll, I'll tell you, the market is in billion in billions. It's almost unlimited limited as far as we can see. And we expect this business to be bigger than any of the other activities that we've been involved in, e even though those are meaningful. Our mines and our resources, our gold and silver are in the hundreds of millions, if not higher. Um, this, this, this will be bigger. Gotcha. And once again, appreciate that. Uh, the next question here is from Frank. Uh, he's asking, what do you feel is the total value of your non-mining assets? So the non-mining assets, um, you know, there, there's the 10 million for the assets we have under contract for sale. There's about 10 million in, in marketable securities that are sellable. And then there's some cats and dogs. But I think the answer is, uh, totals about 25 million. And so what's kind of mind boggling for us, and, and, you know, we have to take responsibility for it. And it's one of the reasons we're here talking with all the folks today is our entire market cap is 25 million. So we're sitting here in a situation where we have no, we'll have no debt and, and we've got $25 million dollars of assets that other people are willing to pay for. Like, in other words, those are either contracted sales or, you know, market prices of other people's securities. And so that would argue that the entire 10 square mile district, all of our asset position, our mercury business, our gold and silver in the ground is valued at zero. So, you know, I think that listening to all the companies present, there are so many good companies with so many good value propositions in the last two days, but I just feel like we're the most undervalued, you know, for that reason. So I think as we do affect the sale of the non-mining assets and people see that 10 million go in the bank, you know, and as, you know, we start to prove uh, some of the ounces this, you know, this quarter, next quarter with new technical reports, I, I think you're going to see that value get unlocked. But just the non the you know, the skinny is, you know, the non-mining assets alone are worth what other people are saying the whole company's worth, which is crazy for us. Yeah, it's a good point to highlight as well. I'm sure investors will like hearing that. Um, when it comes to our next question, we're going to turn to Joanne. And she's asking, is this clean mercury technology similar to a scrubbing technology that would be used in a roaster mill in Nevada due to the high uh, content of mercury, other uh, deleterious content in the ore? It's been a long day. I can't get words out today. I believe you understand my question. It's actually a great question. I totally do understand it. So, um, so um, no, it's not. And let me explain why. So we we actually, it's a great question by Joanne because we're actually looking, um, and and we already tested to a large degree, a a technology that scrubs, washes, cleanses our spent leach materials on our leach pad. So that one, you know, rather than being mercury remediation. It's more like cyanide detoxification, right? And then it um, and then it reprocesses leach materials. It's using again an organic material, thiosulfate, uh, rather than cyanide. It cleanses the materials. It extracts the remaining silver, and it allows us then to sell the aggregates, the silicas, you know, that that come of our pad. That that's a huge opportunity that we're looking at. The, the, the mercury, however, is slightly different. What we do is, and there's two types of mercury. Mercury is the only liquid element, right? So, so most people think of it as that little silvery ball that, you know, you, you can hold in your palm, which you should not do, but like, okay, that's how most people think of it. 
And that's called, um, you know, that's elemental mercury, of course. When it stays in the environment for extended periods of time, it methylizes. And methylizes means it absorbs into the soil, it absorbs into the vegetation. And in the Carson Rivers case, it'll absorb into the biology, the fish, okay? So what our machines do, rather than scrub, is they have these massive centrifuges. And by centrifugal force, they force the heaviest materials to the outside. And so those materials would be mercury, gold, and silver. And then we have what we call a mercury reactor, which has an organic solution. And that's one of our, you know, sort of trade secrets that we don't disclose. And, um, and the reactor then has a, you know, you, let's use the term a cleansing effect, um, but it's not a scrubbing effect. And so by, you know, with the system that, the picture of the system that I showed you has literally three centrifuges, then a reactor, and then some very, very precise separators and spirals. And so when you combine those three process technologies with an organic solution, voila, you have our mercury remediation system, and we don't believe there's anything like it in the world. So um, similar concept in terms of cleansing, but a different process to get there. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Uh, and this next question is also coming from Jan, uh, Joanne. When do you think that you'll be in production uh, in the next phase? So from a mining perspective, we have two mines, uh, the Lucerne and the Dayton. Lucerne will be run by Tonal Gold. And um, we think that there's a two to two plus year um, lead time. Um, in that case, it's mainly for mine development because all the infrastructure and all the permits are in place. For the Dayton, we've said about uh, the same time frame, about two, two and a half years. In that case, the lead time is more related to studies and permitting than infrastructure. So for two different reasons, we have two mines uh, that we're looking to tee up, you know, let's say less than three years away. With the mercury business, literally from 30 to 45 days from deploying the system and their mobile systems, right? We have, um, we, have, um, we have cash or gold, if you will, coming out the other side. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing. Like the mercury system is, um, is, is the opposite of a hard rock mining system, right? Hard rock mining system, you have long lead times, typically measured in years for permitting, years of development. Um, the mercury system has very short lead times, you know, deploy it within a few months. And as soon as it's deployed, you know, 30 to 45 days of ca for cash flow. Very interesting and a very good point to bring up. Uh, this next question is coming from Chris. Uh, he's asking, with the upcoming and promising growth and stated goals of increasing shareholder value uh, for some to recover losses in, in recent years, will the company ever consider a stock buyback or dividend to bolster this uh, when there are steady income streams? Yeah, the answer would be yes. Yeah. So, you know, um, I still think we're a little bit of a ways from that, you know, um, may maybe a couple of years. Um, you know, I think 2021 will be watershed, right? I think 2021, company will be projecting revenues, company will be projecting cash, and we'll be deploying more mercury systems, you know, but, but once we turn that corner and we have cash flows, um, you know, it, then, then it becomes a very real pro possibility to consider to pay dividends. The other thing I'll say, which is not exactly to that point, but still very positive, is that because we've, you know, the company's been around for 17 years, for 13 of those years, we were exploration and development, you know, meaning, you know, no revenues, just costs. Uh, we have over $150 million of net operating losses that will shelter future income. So we're super excited about the idea of generating cash uh, going forward and not having to pay federal tax because we have net operating losses that get to carry forward, which means the cash returns will be uh, stronger, superior, if you will, than they would have otherwise. Um, you know, also supportive of ultimately having discretionary cash flow, uh, which, you know, we would um, we would happily consider paying dividends at that point. Absolutely. Uh, now, this is a longer question, so I'm just going to go through this for, uh, for just a moment here. This is sure. from Jason, uh, and he says, uh, clearly, there's lots of different business units, uh, verticals, and assets here. I don't mind the diversification, but in my experience, the market often struggles to understand all these various moving pieces and often can give credit uh, on just one or two main assets. What is the plan to help the company share fully realize the, uh, these value projections 
Do you think you're limited to just eventual cash sales? Or will you be leaning towards believing the eventual cash flows as reflected in your quarterly financials will finally change the market sentiment and provide proper price appreciation? Yeah, I think it's going to be both. So let me let me explain. So first of all, I really do appreciate that question. I think the reason that our value is so low is that there is confusion that came from the complexity. Now, having said that, we're selling the non-mining activities. Uh, we're, you know, that, that always result in a very strong balance sheet and a funded, a funded profile. But I also think that will result in simplification. So what we want people to know is that we're committed just to being a precious metal company. Now, even when we get to that point, I want to think of it as this simple, right? We have mining assets to the north of our district that a partner is developing that we have specific cash flow and specific royalties associated with. We have mining assets to the south of which we have a specific resource that ultimately will grow and ultimately go into production. And that will manifest itself in two technical reports, one to the north, one to the south, with total clarity on the district's gold and silver resources. And then mercury being deployed, mercury systems being deployed where there's a lot of gold and we'll be generating cash from those. So I get his point. If you're generating a lot of cash, it can override the complexity. And so, yes, that's what we want to do. But we also want to be simple at the same time. <laughs> so, so I don't think the intention is to stay complex. The intention is do everything in our power to focus and simplify in precious metals and then generate the cash on top of it. And I think we'll, we will end up with the best of both worlds you know, the way we've got it, um, got it moving. Absolutely. And we're going to keep going here because there's, they're, they're still coming in. That's why you'll see, you'll see my oh, eyes keep scrolling. I'm paying attention to this. <laughs> Don't great. get me wrong, but I'm trying to read them all and they're it's upvoting to keep actually. moving as well. Uh, this is a question from Ron, uh, Watt. Uh, what is your average grade in comparison to the original grade? And is there still rich deposits to be discovered? Yeah. So very good question. So let me be precise. So in the Lucerne area, which is, which is a specific resource estimate. Tono Gold's gonna to put out a new report. The average grade is, is, is it, you know, and it, the average grade is about a gram per ton. They're, they're looking at um, um, scenarios where the mine plan would have a higher average grade uh, as they optimize it. So that's the first answer. In, in the Dayton, it's about 50% higher for us. You know, we've got about a, a gram and a half you know, which which for an op for both open pit profiles are very are very good grades, um, and and the economics are very strong. Um, the yields and the metallurgies of both of those mines well over eighty percent, which is outstanding for leaching. So that's the first kind of boring answer. You know, the really exciting answer is that um, you know we have um, you know we have the Occidental load and some of the Gold Hill targets, where. Um, you know, the old, that's where the old timers mined and, and the old timers had this basic thesis that they, and, and, and in part because of their technology and because it was the late 1800s, they wouldn't go after gold that was less than 50 grams per ton. And you heard me correctly, 50, 50, not one five, 50. And then they would put a development drift, you know, they didn't have drilling technology, so they'd put a, a tunnel down there. And once that investment was made, they'd only be pulling out at a cutoff of 35 grams per ton. So, so basically what that says is with all the uh, mining that occurred to the north by the old timers, they weren't interested in gold that was less than an ounce per ton. So we've done a tremendous amount of work. Tonal Gold has done a tremendous amount of work together with us. And we found the concept that, you know, there's unbelievable amounts of multiple ounce gold, but there's also unbelievable amount of three quarters of an ounce, half an ounce, quarter of an ounce. I mean, these are exceptionally high grades and, and, and they were known to be left behind. So we've got tons of data. We've done geostatistical models, but we've also gone back and looked at all the old production reports and it's clear that high grade was left behind so when tonal gold starts drilling this month i believe um you're going to start to see some incredible hits you know and you know there's some people that say there's there's it's mathematically impossible that um that all of those discoveries were made 
you know, with the rudiments of, of the old technology. We know that to be true. So, so I think, I think the answer is there's tremendous excitement coming uh, when the next drill rigs, you know, start mobilizing. I'm not a big promoter, so I'm not talking about blue sky. I'm talking about data that we're aware of, you know, locations that we know about um, that are going to be drilled, and we're going to be hearing about a lot of high grades. So I'm very excited about it. I can't wait for them to start. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, we still have about nine minutes here, uh, so we'll go through a few more of these questions. Please. Uh, we've got maybe about eight left or so. Uh, this is from Steven. Is there any chance that the mercury condition could ever come back and cause any type of litigation? So no, not, you know, so from, from a Comstock perspective, it's the, the, um, the contamination is known as the Carson river mercury Superfund site. The EPA came in in the late nineties and, um, there's no, there's no responsible parties. Uh, it was just the old timers who left mercury behind. And over time it, it migrated hydrologically down into the river. Um, we have worked directly with the Nevada EPA and the US EPA and put together mercury protocols, mercury uh, long-term sampling analysis plans, remediation plans, et cetera, et cetera. And in doing that, we defined all the parameters where, um, you know, if you, if you did X, you would trip into a liability. So don't do X, you know. And so we've done it in full conjunction with them. Uh, we're expert at what the regulations are, RECRA and otherwise. And um, we have no liabilities associated with that. Going into other countries and other projects, we're working directly with the government. I was on a two-hour call with uh, the Philippine Department of Environment and Natural Resource, DENR, um, and they're excited and, and outlining working directly with the provincial governors. Uh, you know, the difference is, you know, when you, when you usually come in for a hard rock mining operation, you know, people, you know, they have mixed emotions, you know, they're leery. Oh, there's going to be a lot of disruption. It's mining. OK, um, not only have we proven in hard rock mining that we're socially responsible and at the top of the environmental food chain, but this is completely different. We're coming in to clean up the environment <laughs> and there's no. No size and no rolling of the eyes and no anxiety. Like they can't wait for us to get there. Frankly, for me, it's it's it's. Um, I don't want to sound too exaggerated, but it's like joyous, you know, to be able to, you know, be doing good that way and still extracting uh, the precious metal so that it's sustainable and profitable. Absolutely, well said. Uh, that's what we have here. Uh, this next one is from uh, Ricardo. Um, why has Silver Spring sale been delayed? Uh, what so, is the hold up on that? Uh, on yeah. That sale? So yeah. So I'll tell you quite quite specifically. Um, you know the um, the Silver Springs area is um, is really at the crossroads of of all the economic development that's happening in northern Nevada. It's thirty minutes away from the mine site, so it's not contiguous at all. Um, the the the, um, the Sierra Springs Opportunity Fund, which we helped facilitate and get started raised a tremendous amount of capital last year. They um, they purchased the Silver Springs Airport, so they own and operate the Silver Springs Airport. They purchased a huge manufacturing facility, and then they locked up thousands and thousands of acres of land in Silver Springs, including these two properties, which only represents 250 of those thousands and thousands of acres. Um, and so the money was raised in, in last year. The first few properties were purchased. All the rest of the properties were locked up. You know, and then um, as they were going back to raise money in March, COVID hit, right? And 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 everybody's hair was on fire. So so basically, there was a three month hiatus, which was unfortunate. Um, but you know, markets have uh, recovered. Um, you know, capital raising is back in the saddle, and we fully expect um, it to continue just where it left off. You know, it's a great opportunity. People are investing in it. It's hugely tax incented for the investor. And so um, we see that, you know, we, and we know that that's, that's been the longest, most disappointing delay for us. Uh, and when that happens, you know, there's going to be a tremendous change in ju not just the value of the stock, but, you know, the credibility of everything that we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. well, well, speaking of, of change, that flows into the next question here uh, from Harvey asking, um, will Comstock ever be a physical miner again? I would say yes. Um, so I want to say yes two different ways <laughs> to that question, right? I, I no. Let me say it three different ways. Okay, when when Tono is uh, mining Lucerne, you know our system will be 
doing all the beneficiation, right? So we'll be, you know, we'll be crushing with our equipment, processing with our leach pads, et cetera. So I, I'd like to call that mining. More substantively, uh, we love to see the Dayton mine go into production. It's fully our intention to do that, okay? Um, and then third, and I don't want to sound cute here, but, you know, the mercury systems are also mining. We're, we're taking alluvium and soils from the earth. We're putting them into crushers. We're processing through centrifuges and gold is coming out the other end. So, you know, um, you know, I know we, 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 um, we properly market it as mercury remediation because that's exactly what we're doing, but it's also a mining activity. So yes, yes, and yes, <laughs> Harvey. So um, we're looking forward to all of it. Uh, the next question is for Miko. Uh, a lot of different aspects. How is it reflected on GNA, and how are management uh, aligned with investors? How is management uh, aligned with Very, investors? There? Two great questions. So, from a GNA perspective, think of it this way: we have four and a half million dollars of operating expense, um, and with a caveat. But I want to explain the four and a half first. We got about a million and a half dollars of payroll. We have about 12, 13 people. They're all highly professional from metallurgical to engineering to environmental to geology to finance. Okay, that kind of thing. Million and a half in labor. Million and a half to keep the permitted platform fully in place. So that's property taxes, uh, insurances, permitting fees, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then a million and a half to be a public company. That sounds a little high, and it is. It's really not quite that number. But, you know, we have auditors, we have listing fees, we have lawyers, et cetera. Now, the beautiful thing is that of that $4.5 million, um, we're being subsidized by about almost uh, $2.2, $2.3 million. So let's say half of our costs are being subsidized. So our operating expense, our GNA for a fully permitted platform is about two, $2.2, $2.4 That's quite remarkable in our mind. Um, so all of us um, um, are shareholders. We'd all like to be bigger shareholders. So, you know, the um, the notion would be uh, for us to be buying more equity. Um, I know that some of our board members are waiting uh, just for the blackout period to end so that they could buy more. Um, that should be next week. Um, and so we'd like to be fully aligned with our shareholders. Um, and our goal is our goal is precisely to create $500 million of value to increase the per share value of the company. Um, so we're, we're committed to that. And um, the last three and a half years seem like brutally hard work to get to where we are. We're looking for the next three and a half to be very fun, you know, and value creating. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Well, we're going to do one last question here. Uh, and then, uh, Corrado, I'm also going to open it up so, you know, people can reach out to you because there are some more. We can't get to them all, unfortunately. So sure, sure. A, Wonderful. The Weber coming up here that we've used all the time, which is fantastic to see. Uh, but the last question will be again from Harvey. And it's, um, does Tona Gold have an option to purchase the Dayton? Uh, if so, what, uh, what kind of value would be uh, attributed to that? So Tona Gold, um, you know, is purchasing and will consummate the purchase of Lucerne, I think, this month. Uh, Tonal Gold has leases on some of the properties north of Lucerne. Tonal Gold does not have an option to purchase the Dayton, and Tonal Gold does not have an option to purchase the processing infrastructure. So that's important to understand. Having said that, Harvey, we've gotten more than one inquiry on the Dayton recently, you know, and so... Um, you know, we're open-minded to anything that's value creating, uh, but we're pretty convicted that we first need to publish our next technical report and we need to outline our next drilling program because we really believe the Dayton could be two to three times the resources that it is today with relatively little capital. You know, so before we monetize it, we want to make sure we can demonstrate the higher value. Um, you know, when you're talking about two or three times, if something's worth a hundred million, um, you know, um, and and let me be let me be very careful with that. You know, I showed a slide where at two thousand dollar gold, a hundred million dollars of cash flow drops to the bottom, based on just what we know today. Okay, so we wouldn't, you know, if we doubled that resource, it would more than double that cash flow. So we would like to demonstrate that more credibly through a third party technical report before we have conversations with third parties about what they're willing to pay. Uh, having said that, we think it's highly valuable, highly, highly valuable. 
Absolutely. Well, uh, I do apologize for the other questions that came in. That, that was a lot. There was over a dozen, I believe, uh, that <laughs> it's we answered. It's great. It's really wonderful. Uh, and, and more that came in. Uh, on that note, uh, thank you very much to all that participated uh, in this webinar today, in this presentation. Uh, Corrado, if they were to reach out to you, where can they reach out uh, if they have further questions or anything like that? So my email is my last name, degasperis, D-E-G-A-S-P-E-R-I-S, at one word, comstockmining.com. Uh, so please do email and um, I'm very good at responding by email and also responding by phone uh, with those inquiries. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for taking the time and everyone will see you over at our next webinar. Uh, and this concludes the company aspect of our investor day uh, conference of the last two days, but we'll jump over the last webinar. Thank you very much. Well, once again, Corrado. Thanks, Brandon. That was outstanding. Thank you. Absolutely.